Hi everyone, this is Jan Wilczek from thewolfshound.com and today we are going to talk about this book. It is The Clean Code by Robert C. Martin, which is by some considered the ultimate book on how to write good code. Today I want to share with you my experience with reading this book and lessons that I've learned from it. One quick disclaimer before we begin. I'm going to do this video in two parts. The first one covering more general terms and the second one devoted only to, spoiler alert, testing. So stick around if you find the video interesting. To motivate the need for writing clean code, first let me share with you my story. As soon as I decided to develop my skills further in the area of software engineering, I started looking for sources uh, which would tell me uh, how to write good code, how to solve problems with code, how to structure it, what makes it good for reuse to other programmers. One of the best pieces of advice I got at the time was if you want to learn something, then just Google best book on. And so I did, and I ended up reading The Pragmatic Programmer by Dave Thomas and Andy Hunt. While being a very good read and having a lot of useful principles like don't repeat yourself rule or everything is writing or tracer bullet concept, uh, I found it not that practical because it, because it was mostly focused on programmers as people. Uh, also, the version I read was from the early 2000s, so it seemed a little bit outdated. Anyway, the 20th anniversary edition is out now, so maybe that's worth looking at. Another start that comes to my mind when thinking about clean code is when a colleague of mine did a peer review of my code at the company I was working at. He asked me through Slack, did you read clean code? No, I said. His reaction was, one can see that. Actually, the advice to read clean code started coming to me from different directions. So I finally decided to give it a try. I will share with you the lessons I learned from it, one by one. Should you read it as well? Wait and see until the end of the video. So without further ado, let's begin with number one, which is aspects as a separation of concerns strategy. Most programmers know the single responsibility principle, which says that each class should only do one thing. Or expressed differently, each class should have only one reason to change. In reality, it's really difficult to achieve because most of the classes we write need additional features like logging or database updating. That's where aspect programming comes in. Aspect-oriented programming lets you write your core business logic in the so-called plain old Java objects, and then define additional functionalities, so-called aspects, which are then inserted between your method calls by a specialized framework. As you can see, the functionalities are, or responsibilities are separated. In theory, it is an elegant solution, but in practice it heavily relies on the framework use. But it enables you to separate concerns efficiently, thus enabling smooth scalability of the system because the modules are loosely coupled encapsulating if conditions in functions. It's much more readable to replace your series of ORs and ANDs with a named function. For example, is empty instead of size equal to zero. It is a simple idea, yet it never occurred to me that extracting such a function with a name would simplify a lot of code. I have to admit, I usually just put comments around it. Simple, but clever. Write code that works first and then make it clean. I too often get stuck trying to write perfect code instantly. That's of course impossible. Writing good code is an iterative process. The only thing you should keep in mind when writing your code 
is that it works as expected, which means tests. We'll come back to it in the next video. The Boy Scout rule. Always leave the campground cleaner than you found it. Too often did I hear excuses from other programmers, myself included, saying, this is not my code. Don't let it happen to you. When your task involves altering some module, always remember to leave it better off than it had been before, which involves adding missing tests and refactoring. Speaking of which, refactoring examples. The book has a ton of examples in support of its thesis, some of which are over 20 pages long, and it's a good thing. I always wanted to look at and learn from examples of good code, but the book goes even further than that. It shows you step by step how messy, overcomplicated real world code gets transformed into a beautiful, manageable module. It even includes some examples of open source libraries refactoring. I found the cognitive process and the reasoning behind all the steps extremely informative, and I think it could be the sole reason to read this book. Don't use switch statements. The authors argue that whenever there is a switch statement in code, it's a hint that polymorphism should be used. It may seem obscure at first, but if you think about it, it kind of makes sense because a switch instruction implies that multiple handlers should be used and multiple objects of the same type that do different things is exactly what polymorphism is. Clever, huh? Encapsulating boundaries of the system. How to include an external library into your code? It is quite a tricky task for a newbie programmer. I know because I had to deal with it at the beginning of my software developer career. The author suggests that we should include a separating interface, namely use the adapter or decorator pattern that would separate the external library from the system and the services that that library should provide. It is a simple yet profound answer because it implies that we don't have to necessarily know which library we are going to pick. It also enables efficient testing through test doubles implementing that interface. It reduces the coupling considerably and enables to replace the library with a newer version or a completely different dependency. Early stop and early start in multi-threaded code. Because of thread dependencies like in the producer-consumer problem, the programmer of a multi-threaded system should ensure that all the threads finish properly regardless of the configuration. You may sometimes experience random exceptions thrown when exiting your program. I know I did. Such exceptions are an effect of a non-deterministic thread completion. Such quasi-random situations should be heavily tested against to eliminate a possible source of unexpected bugs in production code and especially in releases. Separation of code from its execution. Dealing with and reasoning about multi-threaded code is difficult. One needs to take into account multiple factors and ensure that the result is always deterministic. It may be especially important for a system that has to run continuously and cannot be easily stopped and rerun. The authors of Clean Code suggest that program's logic should be separated from its execution policy. After all, Business logic does not depend on how many threads or computers it is run on. We may think of it in terms of single responsibility principle. There should be classes that deal with core business logic, for example, HTTP request handling, and classes that are responsible for their execution, for example, thread runners. Such separation also enables configurability which in turns 
makes possible testing in a single threaded scenario, which is especially important if we wonder what does not work, our business logic or its execution, the multi-threaded code. It also makes a lot easier to understand the business logic because we don't have to muddle through code involving logs and executors when trying to understand that. Abstraction levels of functions. It has never occurred to me that functions should not only do one thing, but also should do one thing at one abstraction layer. It can be best explained through example. Imagine a class that's constructing an HTTP response. Should it deal with formatting the message or inserting commas or manipulating the output string? Probably not. It's best to delegate such low-level tasks to some lower-level functions that operate on a lower level of abstraction. Delegating these tasks makes your code much more readable, less error-prone, and probably helps you to adhere to the don't repeat yourself principle. That's all in a short video, but the whole book covers much, much more along with extensive examples, so don't hesitate to get your own copy. I put a link in the description below. In the next video, I'll talk about testing, namely, why is it so important? As usual, I'll link to the related article in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the thumbs up and subscribe for the following videos. That's all from me. Take care.